Hey folks, hello. Uh, just a couple of apologies first. The first is I am suffering from a throat infection, so my voice is a little bit croaky. But uh, the second is I have a little bit of a funny accent, and I'm sorry about that. There's nothing I can do about it. It's the one I was born with. So if I say things that don't make any sense, it's possible they don't make sense, but also it's possible that I need to repeat myself. So just stick your hand up and say, what the hell? because I'll probably repeat and try and make it a bit clearer. So stick your hands up at any point if you want to ask a question or make a silly comment or whatever. Apologies again for the slight croak in my voice, but uh, I'm doing my best. Right, functional programming. This incidentally is, there's some links here to, it's a bit funny color there, my website, uh, a Twitter handle, that's a barcode, feel free to, in the unlikely event that anyone wishes to speak to me again, you can feel free to reach out and uh, grab me on Twitter or wherever. I usually respond well to questions and bribes. <clears throat> Briefly about me, I have been in IT for nearly two decades now. Um, I have worked in all sorts of places, including government, getting uh, the UK folks to pay their taxes properly, yay. Uh, I worked for retail, manufacturing, um, I was briefly one of those contractors that your mum used to warn you about. And these days I work for Muller Dairies. I don't know if Muller is especially well known here in France. No, fairly well known in the UK for a particular brand of rather delicious yogurt. And in Germany, mostly for milk. But that's what we do. We make sure that people have milk. And that's not a terrible thing to be doing. Uh, <clears throat> so, pardon. Like I said, I'm doing my best. Now, I am a big fan of films, so rather than an agenda, I have a program of events. I have the slightly inaccurately named six W's, the who, what, where, why, when, why, and how of functional programming. I'll start with some of the who and what, so far and so on first to set, lay the scene for what on earth this is all about. So first off, who is functional programming? By which I mean, these are some people who are significant to the history of functional programming. One of them is a software developer. See if you could guess which one. So not this one, this is Alonzo Church. He was a, an American mathematician, worked in the 1950s. Uh, this stuff you can see down here is some of what we uh, still use of his work to this day. This is a shorthand way of writing a function uh, with an arrow here to indicate the function body. This is an arrow function. The other interesting thing is this symbol here, which denotes a parameter. That's the Greek letter lambda, hence lambda expression. There we go. That's been around technically longer than computers sort. This is Haskell Curry, who has no fewer than three programming languages named after him, including, of course, Haskell. That's the famous one. And this is an example of something called currying, named after him. I will be going into that in a bit, but once again, all you need to know is he was fairly significant in the early days of what became known as functional programming. And then finally, and could this possibly be a software developer with his awesome beard of manliness? It is. This is John McCarthy, who created arguably the world's first functional programming language in the 1960s. It was called Lisp, uh, Lisp Processor or something I think it stood for and uh, apparently still has its fans to this day and apparently could do wild things like effectively rewrite innumerables as they were going around. I, I don't know, never used it. This is Lisp, don't ask me what it does, I don't know. But the point is, there we go. This is how far back this goes. And shall I, um, shall I just close the, yeah, thank you, much appreciated. They don't want to listen to me any more than I want to listen to them. Right, so what is functional programming not. The point of the last few slides was that functional programming is not new. In fact, it's very old. It goes back a very long way, probably far longer than anyone would realize. As I've just shown, the first functional programming language dates back to the 1960s. But the roots of functional programming go back even further. They go back to maths papers, mostly written in the 1950s. But I tried tracing the chain of papers, referencing papers, to see where it would lead. And I eventually found mathematics papers that dated back to the late 1800s. 
And I did not understand a single one of them because I am not a mathematician. Caveat at the door there, I'm not, I'm not. And anyone expecting formal definitions and mathematical working, I'm not gonna give it because I don't understand it. I'm an engineer and as such, I'm giving an engineer's description of what this is all about. Okay, it is not a language. C Sharp is a language. Uh, JavaScript is a language, possibly. Um, you get the idea. It is a paradigm. So what's a paradigm? Well, a paradigm is a style of programming. Uh, if you want the metaphor of a guitar as an instrument, you may play many forms of instrument of music on that same instrument. You can play rock music, you can play pop music, you can play country and western if you have no taste, but whatever. You can play many styles on the same thing. So it is with paradigms of programming, of which there are many. The two dominant being uh, imperative and uh, declarative. Imperative programming, which this is not, imperative is typically the sort of programming you get taught when you first start learning to program. This is where you use if statements, while loops, all that sort of thing that direct a little arrow around your code and it has to be told exactly where to go and when and start with this empty object and start building up piece by piece. Meticulous attention to every step and how it is all achieved. That is the imperative approach. Functional is not imperative. Functional is declarative. Declarative code is less interested in how we achieve it, and we're more interested simply in what we want. Uh, the most common form of declarative language you're likely to have encountered is TSQL, or any variants on SQL. Because if you think about it, when you look at an SQL statement, do you care what the order of operations is? No. Why should you? It's not important. If you look at the lines as they're written, select, order by, and you've got your where, or your, the, typically the select is gonna be one of the very last things executed. Not always, but often. And should you care? No, it's fine. You're describing what you want. And then the detail, of the order of operations, <laughs> is, uh, is left to the, uh, entirely to the execution environment. And this is how it is with functional, okay? We are less interested in the precise details of how we achieve this great big object at the end of it. And what we're really interested in is simply what do we want? So I do find object-oriented developers who say, well, I don't understand how this is all built up. This is rubbish. And my answer is typically, I don't care. It's fine. It works. Um, and it is not the solution to all of your problems. I would hazard a suggestion that it is a solution to many. Uh, it will not make the tea. Or, or, or whatever, it will not do your ironing, sadly, but it will certainly make your day job easier. Uh, it will make your code easier to read and various other improvements. And uh... <laughs> and it is not difficult. There is a common myth that functional programming is difficult to understand. This is not true. It's very different to object-oriented coding, but that's all it is. In fact, there are fewer things to learn with functional programming than object-oriented. It's just that with a lot of us, a lot of us have spent a long time, like myself, working in an object-oriented style, and so are deeply entrenched in that way of thinking. The folks that I approach find that uh, adopt functional programming the easiest are often folks straight out of university who haven't been indoctrinated into the ways of the OO the way that the rest of us have. So I would argue it's not difficult. So what actually is it? Okay, there's some scary words on here, but none of them are actually all that hard to understand once you get rid of the scary buzzword. It is declarative, I kind of talked about that. Uh, it is immutable. Now all this means is that all variables and properties within um, a functional program are considered immutable, meaning once they are set, they may not change ever again. Uh, you may not change a variable to, a new, uh, to replace it with a new valuable value, you may not change its properties. You may not extend or anything. It is everything from the moment it is set, is set in stone. If you want to think of this another way, it's like a maths paper. When you do maths exams or maths, you have to do your working. Uh, you do line by line. Each line builds on the line before. 
you don't retrospectively go back and sort of mark that seven out and turn it into an eight because you've moved to change something down here. What went before is set, and each line builds on the previous. It tends to give you more stable, more readable, and more e uh, code that is easier to debug. It may seem strange if you've never done it, but trust me, it works. Higher order functions, actually easier than it sounds once again. Functions passed around either as the parameters into a function or as the return type from a function. Uh, typically a func delegates. Are we okay with func delegates? Yeah? Good. Gonna be a tough talk for you otherwise. Um, so that's all that is. An uh, action delegate as well will count. Uh, functions, not statements. A statement is a line which does not evaluate to a value. So a while, a while loop, a for loop, an if statement, all of those things, those are statements. Functional does not use them. Uh, func in functional, everything is, is actually a function. This is a rule of thumb in functional. If there is a question, the answer is functions. And that roughly holds true. So we have other ways of building up objects than using loops and branching ifs and stuff like that. Once again, referring back to the idea of writing code like a maths paper. Uh, referential transparency, another scary name, but all it means is it's also called pure functions. So it's the idea of uh, given the same parameter values, a function will always return the same answer with no side effects, no matter what. No matter what state the system is in, no matter anything, excepting perhaps that you hit the off button, that will probably change things. But other than that, that's it. Same values in, same answer back. Nothing else happens. And if you write all the functions in your code base to that style, you get a really solid code base that's far less likely to error or give you any, any sort of issue. And it also makes it easier to uh, debug and to uh, test. Recursion. Are we okay with recursion? Yeah, good. Once again, tough talk otherwise. Uh, pattern matching. I used to have to explain this, but I don't really have to anymore. Switch expressions in C sharp 8 and upwards. That's pattern matching. It's just really advanced switch statements where you can switch on type and sub properties of the object, stuff like that. Pattern matching. F sharp can actually do more still to this day than C sharp can, but we've got most of the same abilities these days as F sharp. Most of them. A few things we can't, pretty much everything we can. Stateless. It has no state. Object-oriented coding is based often on the idea that you have a state object which sits in the middle, and then periodically you ping new data into it, pull data out of it, update it. Well, we are immutable. We can't have that. We have no state. State is a transitive emergent property of the system. Uh, has anybody worked with Redux in React.js? That is pretty much how we handle state, by which I mean you have a state object, but it exists for a moment. And then every time someone changes, you pass in something like an instruction of, given the original old state object, some parameters and an instruction, build a new state object based on the old one, and then replace the old one with the new one. So state is a series of objects that exist for a moment and then are discarded by a, a replaced version. That's how we handle state. Monad. So according to Douglas Crockford, the curse of the monad is that once you gain the ability to understand it, you lose the ability to explain it. So I shan't. And it's not difficult. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll agree. So where is it? It can be anywhere before anyone starts throwing things at me. I know it can do anything. But where is it? Where, uh, where is it you'll find it? Uh, functional languages. There are the purer functional languages. Haskell, Erlang, Elm, they have their fans. I am told that these are used in production in certain industries. I've heard stories of Haskell being used in banking. Um, Erlang, I think Erlang's at the back of RabbitMQ. Um, so I'm, I don't know, but they do exist. I have never used them. I am a C-sharp developer, that's what I work in. Okay, there's the hybrid languages. High languages that support multiple paradigms. Jarvis, of course, C-sharp. It is a stated intention of Microsoft team that C-sharp will support both paradigms, object-oriented and functional, going forward. And if you look, since about C-sharp 3, 
every version of C Sharp has contained something for functional programming. And that, that has not changed. To this day, every single version of C Sharp since 3 has added more functional features. And as far as I'm aware, there is no intention for that ever to, to halt. So if you're doing functional C Sharp, you're doing it properly, according to Microsoft. F Sharp, F Sharp is the .NET functional language. It's not pure functional, but it's a lot more purely functional than C Sharp is. It's more functional by default, whereas C Sharp has to be kind of hacked around with to make it more functional. Uh, so if you want to take this further, then F Sharp might well be a place to go. I don't know F Sharp, but I know a lot of people who do, and they all love it. So it's a place for you to go. And finally, JavaScript, because JavaScript does everything. Because JavaScript is everything, except when it isn't, except when it's an empty array, except when it's a function, except when it's not, or something. I don't know, because it's JavaScript, the wild west of programming. So when is it, once again? It can be anywhere. It can do anything. You can do full stack, functional C sharp. It's totally possible. But there are places where it's happiest and places where it's necessary to make um, uh, some fudgy code to make it work because we can't be pure. So where it's happiest, data processing. Turn this data into this data. Functional loves that. It's perfect at it. Concurrent systems, that is, where you've got a whole load of instances of the same program listening on the same queue or something of that sort, then once it, uh, because we're stateless, because we, we don't have uh, side effects in our functions, it tends to support concurrent and async programming very well. We don't tend to get resource prod contentions the same way in functional that you often do in object-oriented, because there is no concept of the state. High criticality systems, it is a common um, claim from the pure functional languages that once you get these things to actually run, nothing will bring them down. And that might well be true, I've no reason to doubt it. We can't quite achieve that in C sharp, but we can get pretty close. And it's serverless, same sort of reason. If you're interested in things like Azure functions or what is it, AWS Lambda functions, I think it is, that's the, the AWS version, then this once again supports that very well. When is it not? Now, it can do these things, but this is where you have to make um, this is where you have to make some allowances for the fact that you've got uh, some non-functional stuff to interact with. And different languages have different ways of uh, um, getting around these problems. Uh, with Haskell, it's pretty much always monads, uh, but I'm not going to go into all of that. So UI, this is stuff where there is interactions and side effects, impurity. There is nothing more impure than a human being. And once we have to interact with a human being, we can't guarantee no side effect. Because goodness, has anyone worked ever worked in support? Yeah, because if you have, then you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, external interactions, web APIs, connections to the database, anything like that. Because there's not just what might happen inside the database, there's also what happens during transit, what happens while the HTTP request is going around the network. All manner of things can happen which will result in some sort of exception you didn't consider. So this, once again, is where you've got to make a concession to the fact that we can't be purely functional. And finally, I.O., same sort of reason. What if someone opens the file separate to the computer or deletes it when you're not looking? Anything is possible. The metaphor that I like to keep in my head is that of a shadow. Now, a shadow, broadly speaking, has two parts. Now, your chappy doing drawing here will probably know there's about 12 parts of a shadow, but broadly, there's two. There's the very dark, solid bit in the middle. That's called an umbra. And there's the gray, fuzzy bit around the outside. That's the penumbra. And what I try to do is to maximize the dark, solid, purely functional bit in the middle and make that as large and as much of the system as I can. And the bits where I have to make concessions to non-functional Try and minimize those. Try and make those as small and pushed as far away as possible. Because you're going to have to concede somewhere. And that's just the way it is. So finally, why? And then I'll just quickly go through this. It's concise. A functional code base can be between a third to a half the size of an object-oriented code base. That's a massive reduction in lines. And that's not just for the sake of it. The point is that 
functional pushes forward the reason the code exists um, because we don't use so much of that those statements which are the building blocks of how you achieve it because we don't have all that code noise it's easier to tell what does this code do this saves time uh, with coding it makes it easier to read when someone else has to pick up your code so I would say it makes for a happier development experience uh, and it's extremely testable, which is a big thing for some folks. When you've got the idea in of you no know, side effects of pure functions, it's very easy to write unit tests. Very easy to get up to close to 100% unit test coverage. That's just basically built into it. it. Enables concurrency, more robust, and it's fun. I think it's fun. And I'm hoping everyone will agree by the end of the talk. There. This is some decidedly non-functional code. This is a bit of object-oriented. So, oh, and incidentally, if anyone recognizes the story titles over in the top corner, you are automatically one of my friends. Uh, because these are the story titles of the very first season of Doctor Who from 1963, uh, starring the boss, William Hartnell. Uh, because Doctor Who, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, it is uh, the best TV series in the whole world. That's actually in the dictionary, if you check. Just as long as I'm already left by the time you check. Um, so, you've got about five seconds to work out what that does. That's not so easy, is it? Uh, you notice, incidentally, that there's the little green lines under there. That's Resharper tugging at my sleeve saying, hey, hey boss, I got an idea, I got an idea. Because Resharper, to be honest, tends towards more functional in its style when you follow all the suggestions. Here's the functional version. Now, before anybody says, isn't that a whole load of link? That's a whole load of link. Because, little secret, link is based on the functional paradigm. Link is entirely functional. Uh, if you think about it, you supply functions as parameters. Yeah, there's a function. See? And it's an arrow, just like uh, your chap um, Alonzo Church would have agreed with. Um, it does not change anything on any of these lines. Whenever you do a select statement, it does not change the original enumerable. It creates a new one based on the old one. With, and the old one is still in scope for as long as you need it. So this is functional code. And you'd probably be astonished if you saw what the actual order of operations was in this. It won't be quite what you think it is. Try pressing F11 again and again into this stuff, and you'll probably find strange things happening. Should you care? No. Why should you? And what I am trying to do is to turn the whole of C-sharp into stuff that looks more like this. Chains of functions that describe what I want without much regard for precisely how I achieved it. So here's another example. This is a block of object-oriented code, which I used to work with a lot. There's a, a thing in the UK called a NINO. This is a national insurance number. And I used to work for the uh, tax folks, so I spent a lot of time validating NINOs. There are a set of rather silly rules, which involve these characters can only be digits, these characters can only be letters, and it's these letters only, and so on and so forth. And what I've got in this code base is a set of if statements. And each if has a rule in it. Uh, this one says the length. Must be, uh, if, if the length is not nine, then return false. If we don't start with an alphanumeric, then return false, and so on and so on. Every single one says, check the rule. Rule is not followed, return false. Finally, at the end, uh, it's just disappeared off the bottom of the screen, actually. But finally, at the end, what you get is a return true. Okay, that is a long-winded way to do it. That is the object-oriented approach. The functional approach looks more like this. Now, there's a few ways we could have done this. I like to be descriptive, but uh, so there's all sorts. Because did you know that you could put funks into arrays? because you can. And once you start putting funks into arrays, you could do some really strange things. So this is actually an array of funks. Each one of these funks, now I've defined them up here because then it means I can give it a name. You don't have to. You could just put arrows straight in here. I'd also consider that acceptable. But um, all these are funks that turn string into bool. So what it means is give me the Nino as a string, the national insurance number, and then the bool says, this is good, true, or this is bad, false. And I've called a dot all. 
Now, the dot all is a link expression. And um, that says, x, given x, whatever, the, take the Nino, take the spaces out of it, pass it into the function. That will be this one first, then this one, then this one. And because it's in an all, the rules of the all are evaluate whatever's in here, one at a time, using each element from the array. If a single one of them returns false, the whole thing returns false. If every single one returns true, return true. This is a complete replacement for the previous slide, except that it's on a fraction of the amount of space. And, I mean, except that I've put that up there for naming. Didn't have to. You could just literally put arrow expressions in here if you wanted. Technically, that would make it one line. One really, really, really long line. But still one line. And you get the idea. But also, let's bear in mind that this is a lot easier to read. We have a description of what we are doing. And if you needed to amend this, potentially you need only add one extra line here and then an extra rule is added, rather than the previous example where there had to be four. And you can even go a step further. Extension methods get a bad reputation. I quite like them. They have their place. So I've made an extension method called validate, which attaches to uh, a T. That means it's a generic. That means it attaches to everything everything in the whole of C-sharp. And then after that, I use params because I can't be bothered to create a new array every time. And then uh, just give me whatever T is, turn it into a bool. So that means that everything now in the whole of C-sharp has got a validate function hanging off it. And if I call validate, I can do nina.replace here, call validate, and then just give a list of all the functions that validate it as true. This makes the validation process a lot easier than following the old object oriented version. It's another example of a functional structure. So this is where I've got two sources of data. I call this, I've called this an altier. Another thing that you'll often find with functional programming, there is no one great big book of these are all the terms and what they mean. Or if there is that book, it's probably a maths paper, which I've never read. So you may hear these things called many things. I'll try and point out other names when I know them. But what alt says is, I've got two different ways to get this data. I don't know which one will work. Try them one after the other until one works. So in my totally, this could represent, for example, web APIs. It could be a database. It could be a file. I don't honestly care. But in my case, I am saying this one works and this one doesn't. And I'm trying the one that doesn't work first, then the one that does. Now, feeding these into the alt, I've started my input, call the alt, pass each function in, and this will try them one after the other. We'll try this, find it doesn't work, move to that one. It's another way of gluing functions together. Uh, functional programming is in many ways like Lego. We are building up applications from functional bricks, piece by piece, until we've made a little model of Elsa from Frozen or whatever it is you're trying to achieve. So how does this work? How do we do this try and then retry process? A uh, couple of extension methods behind the scenes. I've had to make a couple to make this work. And there's all sorts of ways you could achieve this, but this is how I did it. So I've started with a function called if default do. Call it what you like, really. And this attaches to everything. It takes a func, which turns an old thing into a new thing, whatever that might be. And we also got a default, meaning that we'll, do, uh, we'll check whatever this is with a null comparison. This is a slightly scary looking line. All that is is a null check. With a generic, you can't do a null check because not everything defaults to null. Integers default to zero, booleans default to false. Now, this might not be correct behavior, in which case you'll have to make this code a lot more complicated to deal with the other types, but uh, that's outside the scope of this talk. And what I'm saying is, check whatever this is. If it's default, as in it's null, do the else state function. That's the else function, do that. Otherwise, return whatever the original input was unmodified. <coughs> Excuse me. And that is used here in the alt. So I've got the this. I've got the func, which is first function, first func, the second function. I will run first function. Call if default do, meaning that if the first one returns null, which I know it does because I wrote it, then it will fail. It'll, the null check will be null. Then it will run the else function, which is passed here. There we go. That took ages to explain. Doesn't take very much time to actually use it. And this is a fork. 
Now, I have created a stupidly simple example because I don't want to get bogged down in the details of some particular process or, or whatever. All I want to do is explain how it works. A fork works by starting with a single value and then taking that value and having it processed separately by various functions, all of which return some sort of result. And then finally, we have another function which takes all of those results in an array and then compile them down into a single final result. So one to many, back to one. That's a fork. And in this case, I am starting with an input string which has got some A's and B's and so on in it. Um, I start by saying my, this is my gluing function, which as it happens is a sum, as in add them all together. And then here I'm saying, these are the, these are the prongs of my fork. I am saying, first, uh, the first one will take the original string, get a number of all the A's, the second one will get a number of all the B's. Yeah, I mean, this is actually a trivial thing to do without a fork, but the point is just to show you how it works. Start with this, split it into a series of counts, and then this thing will come back together again. No need for any, any further uh, code structure. The result as it happens is nine. And that's what it looks like behind the scenes. Um, I've, this is my fork, and this uses another little gluing function, which is one of the handiest little things you probably never realize you need. It's called map. Now, map is a bit like a select. It's not the same as a select. A select it works on an array, an enumerable, and it says go through each element separately. A map works on the whole object, but the same principle applies. Uh, map gets called all sorts of things. JavaScript has a version of it, I think, these days. Um, and so that means that if you feed map an enumerable, then x in your arrow function will be the whole enumerable, not an individual element. You can also call map on a string, then x will be that string. You can call it on an int, then x will be that int. It's just a handy way of transforming one value into another without needing to bother to create an temporary variable or just sort of mush them all onto one line. It just looks nice like. So all I'm doing is input this, uh, I need my join function, and the params, because once again, I'm too lazy to make an array of prongs and then do a select that's just prongs dot select inside the select feed um, each one of the functions within the prongs the original source input and then finally call map and pass it the join function once again it took me a while to explain that it doesn't take an awful lot of time just to use it So I might skip along this a little because these days you don't really need to know too much about this. But this is a bit about how you use uh, pattern matching. So the standard model of how you mess around with inheritance in object-oriented examples is bank accounts. So I have got a standard bank account with a balance and an interest rate, a super-duper bank account um, with a bonus interest rate, and then finally a dodgy bank account with a brown paper bag of money probably left in a car park. At this point, I would make reference to a politician who has embarrassed themselves in the May papers. These days, I'll take your pick. Plenty to choose from. Just assume whoever you don't like. And there's how you'd use pattern matching. We can, now this is actually switching based on the base type, which is bank account. And then underneath that, you can do each case based on the actual child type. Uh, you can also throw in a when to say, this is a standard bank account when the balance is less than 10,000, and, and so on. So we can start with a child type. We can, base, we can um, feed in the parent type, references the parent type, and then do switches where we can assume the child type, and it will automatically wrap it into the correct type in a local variable, only accessible within this case. Which, consider just how much code I would have to write to write that without a, a switch expression. It would be a phenomenal amount of code. Um, we've got, we have moved on a bit since this talk. This talk's about five years old now. So this is one of the few areas where we've had active development since I started. And we've got a slightly nicer, slightly JSON-y looking syntax now where we can use the curly braces to, to uh, do the exact same thing. But really, this is still doing the same stuff. So immutability. Can we do immutability in C sharp? Well, sort of, yes and sort of no. Uh, this is immutable, effectively. This is pretty good. Um, I have only allowed these properties to be set within 
the, param the constructor, and I have no set. So you can't change these. This is fine. This is fine. But what about this? I have now added a list, an I list. Um, is this immutable? Now, you can't change the list for a new list. That is true. But you can still add and subtract from the list. So this is not immutable. This is immutable now. You can give me a list in, and I will convert it to an immutable array. This is immutable. We're fine again. This is back to being immutable. How about this? Subclass. I don't know. I don't know what subclass is. It might be. If I wrote it, it probably is. If it came from the outside world, who the heck knows? And this is the problem. Uh, so, yeah. So, this is a bit of a sore point. Strictly speaking, no, we can't do immutability, and we probably never will be able to, for reasons of backwards compatibility. We've got stuff that I'll show you in a second that will kind of help a bit, but fundamentally, it's not going to happen. Not everyone likes me for what I'm about to say, but my approach is pretend that it's immutable. You'd be surprised how well that works. Just pretend. Sometimes you won't have any choice because you're pulling in like the mail class from C Sharp, and that thing's really not supporting anything. It doesn't even have interfaces. When you mess with that, you can't. But whenever you can, just pretend. And and by and large, that, that works well enough. Uh, there are a few things you can throw in. We've got nullable enable warnings, which will now give you a warning if you try and make something null. Yeah, if you do that, that will help a bit. Um, and it'll put stuff like this in if you try to uh, change something in a way that, uh, set something in a way that might be null. Yeah, and there's even an exclamation mark, which is the sign that says, I'm a grown up. I know, just do it. Uh, that you've got something like that in F sharp, I believe, where in F sharp everything is immutable by default, but you can deliberately make something mutable because you have to, often because you have to interface with C sharp. So you can do stuff like that. Uh, you can set it globally here. Now you can tell this is a few years old still, but it's still the same principle. You can set it nullable in the uh, in the CS proj. No, that's that's fine. Uh, we've also got init. I tend always to use init set rather than set these days. Init means you may set it when you instantiate the object for the first time. After that, you may not change it. That's pretty good. That is probably as much of a concession to immutability as I make to be practical. Because at the end of the day, functional's good, but we are as C-sharp developers, we still have to be practical about it. We still have a day job, and this code is intended for production. So there's no real point in playing around getting the last few percent of functional if it means it's going to get hard for people to do their day jobs. So this is pretty good. I'm happy in this level. Other people may disagree and have done, but this is as far as I go. And finally, this is a recent feature which was added for functional again. Um, this is uh, record types. Has everyone messed with record types? Record types are cool, and they are. What it means is uh, they're actually hidden classes at the moment. I, I heard tell that there's a plan to make it so that they'll turn into structs or something, or there's a version that was structs. But at the moment, they're actually hidden classes. But when it's a record type rather than a class, you can use a with to say, make a copy of the original with all the same properties except this. And that saves a huge amount of code because when I, as I said before, functional handles state by copying over the old state and turning it into new state, this makes it significantly easier. Because if you just add new properties onto my class or whatever, then um, the width will just automatically carry all that over, accepting whatever the logic requires you not. Now, this, as it happens, is a silly little example I drew together, which says, based on this enum and this parameter, update the property of the person class that I say. So if it's the enum says first name, then create a copy of the person where the first name is changed. That's a silly example, but I literally use these things all the time. Currying. I said I would talk about currying. This is nothing to do with delicious, delicious Indian food, um, although I do love that very much also. This is named after Haskell Curry, which was his name. Uh, so I don't know if anyone's familiar with currying, but I'll talk about it in brief. This is a hypothetical example where we could have a curried function. So 
we'll start with uh, an add. So we've got an add function. We've got an A and a B, two integers. Okay, easy peasy. A plus B, that's all right. Um, if we give it two values, 10 and 20, we get back 30. Not too taxing so far. But if this is a curried function and we give it only one value, it takes two, but we give it one. What? This isn't really C sharp, this is pseudo C sharp, so yes, in real C sharp, this would give you a compiler warning. But um, if this was a hypothetical curried function, what would this return? Does anyone happen to know? Go on. Another function, because the answer is always functions. Yes, what this gives you back is a function. So there is actually only one. Currying is a way of using one function with a load of parameters many times, creating many variances and versions of it, but only having one function at the base. It's vaguely like inheritance, and people get cross at me for saying that, but it kind of is. Um, but the point is that if we have a add, which takes two parameters, and we give it 10, we get back a function where the x, or the original x, is filled in. I think it was called a in the previous one. What we effectively get back is an add 10 function. Because it's not a value yet, we haven't given it the second parameter. Because we haven't given it the second parameter, it can't say what it wants to be, a finally is a value, but it can say, here's what you did so far, fill in the rest when you're ready. So then we can answer the 20, pass it into this function, and you'll get back a 30. Or we could give it any other value, and it will add 10 to it. Okay, that's currying. Now, can we do this in C sharp? The short answer is no ish. Long answer is yes, kind of. A bit. There are a couple of ways of doing it. This is currying in C sharp. Now, the thing to notice here is there are two arrows. And look at the return type as well. It's not an int. These are effectively factories creating funks. These are functions that create other functions. So this one is saying, this is an int to int conversion. Now probably decimal to decimal would be a cleverer idea, but int to int is fine for now. You can only supply one parameter, x, and then what you get back is this bit, y arrow x plus y. Because you supplied the x here, whatever this came back as, this func, will actually be a add whatever that is to y. So you can only supply one parameter at a time, and you get back a func, which you then have to fill in the remaining parameter with. This is currying. In fact, this is true currying. Um, so that, that has its uses. It has some uses. I do use this once in a while, if for no other reason than for slightly more descriptive looking code. There is another way. Now, this is strictly not currying. This is something called partial application, which is actually the same thing. It's just there's more than one parameter at a time. Uh, but basically the same concept. So this, once again, returning to Doctor Who, because Doctor Who is the best. Um, I made a parse function. This is a long parse function with many parameters. A string, a car, an int, a string. It's a lot. -ish. And here we go, A, B, C, D, arrow to split on A. So split by the line ending. This will be slash R slash N, most likely in Windows. It could be something else. Then the next line is inside that we'll call split once again inside a select, meaning we'll split to an array of arrays based on the character split. So B, that's a comma in my case. Could be anything, but for now it's a comma. Then down here we're doing another select to say uh, take inside this thing the, ar the array of arrays in each instance take out this item. So C is an integer. So if it's zero, take this one. That is the code of the episode. If it's a one, take the title of the episode. And if it's a two, take uh, my personal rating of how good it is. Uh, the first Dalek story is really good. The sensor rights is terrible. That's, that's my opinion. And my opinions are always correct. So that's what we get. This is a whole load of parameters. And what we get is this split by line, then split by character. Uh, a grid, then take, tell me which one you want. And then finally, the string at the end is about this, the whole block, the actual thing to process. So we can use partial application to apply several parameters at a time to create new functions, like this. This is how I'd use it. Let's not worry for the moment on how on earth I'd do it. Let's imagine that I've created a partial application, uh, and I'll call it apply. Here it is. 
So this line says, take the original base function, call apply, and give it two values, the slash r slash n, the new line, and the comma. This means that this function here is now a function which takes two parameters, that is, which item do you want, and give me the actual string to process. And given that, I will split it first on new line, then split it again on comma. And then you've got to tell me what you want to do with the rest. This one says, is now a function of called get codes. So this wants to get all the story codes, because every episode of Doctor Who had a story code. And that says, take that, call apply, and give it a zero. This is now a function which will, referencing that one and then the original function, it will take this, split it by line, split it by comma, take the zero position item, and then it only requires you now to actually give me a, a string, an actual CSV to process. And that would just get you the story code. This one then calls this one and applies with a one. That means I've now got a separate function which now takes that, splits it by the line, splits it by the field, and then gets the story titles out. I've got two useful functions. One that gets all the codes, one that gets all the stories. There's still only one function. That hasn't changed. There's still only one function. And all I'm using is partial application to give me separate interfaces into that base function where certain parameters are filled in. That's how you do it. Now, this is really ugly, I'm not going to lie. And it is. It's very ugly. What this is saying is, once again, a function that returns another function, a func returning a func, and you've got to say how many parameters in versus how many parameters out, and then return a new function based on that difference. It's, and to do this, you're going to have to create one of these for every single combination of how many parameters coming in to how many going out, and however many of them you need. You might need 40. I don't know. It depends how much you plan to use this. It also only works on funks. It doesn't work directly on functions. It's just the way it is. If you want to use a function and have some partial application working, you're going to have to store it as a func and then call this. Whether you want to do that or not, I'll leave to yourself. So, this is um, the final step of how you do a functional flow. So, a functional flow. We start on a single thing. First opportunity, split it into many things. Whittle it down, maybe, with a where statement. Do a select to turn it to something else. And finally, there's actually this bit at the end that makes it a complete functional process. Aggregate. Aggregate turns many things into one thing. And this is how you do it in object-oriented code. We'd have a for loop going around, a string builder, because I, I know about the strings being a mutable thing. Um, append commas where necessary with a check to say, uh, is this the last one or not, so we don't put a comma on the end. Blah, 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 blah. There we go. That's the, the, that's the simple version, of course. String.join. Okay, I'm being a little facetious here, but string.join is cool. And I'll carry on talking about it until everyone uses it because it's so much easier than the other version. But moving to something a little more useful, here is a little database of data about my Doctor Who stories. I'll have the code, the title of the story, what I think of it, the rating, the number of episodes, because every single Doctor Who story in the old days was a serial with many episodes. And then how many are missing, because there are to date 97 missing episodes of Doctor Who. So if anyone has any, do feel free to hand them back. I wouldn't mind seeing them myself. And I can do all sorts of operations with aggregate functions in link. There is the sum, which will just say, give me the number of episodes, do a sum within the array. It gives me a sum of all that. That's easy. Uh, that's sum. And then there's average, which isn't strictly average. It's mean. But still, we've got a few. I don't think there is a way to do a median. Uh, but still, yeah, we go. We've got a few aggregate functions that are available, but there's also the grown-ups version of aggregate, which hardly anyone seems to know about, So, which is why I bring it up now. So this is the big version. This is where you want to do a complex aggregation. This aggregation works by first give me the starting value. So in my case, I want to create a tuple, which has got the total number of episodes versus the total number that are missing, which is a simple example. But again, I'm keeping it simple. Give me the starting value, which is naught and naught. Then, this is a slightly extended version of the, select, the idea of the select, except there are two parameters. The accumulator, which is the running total so far, and the current item, which is like your x in your select statement. And then here, we return the new running total. So when we start, we will start with uh, 0, 0. So the first time this execute, ack is 0, 0, because it's defined here. 
And the first story is an unearthly child, which has four episodes and none missing, thankfully. So this would be, item one would be uh, zero, that's no missing episodes, and item two, number of episodes is four. That will execute. Now, this will call again. This time, accumulator will be four zero, because that was the previous updated version. And then it would be the first Dalek story, which has seven episodes that exist, so we'd add in a seven to the number of episodes, and a zero once again to missing, and so on and so forth. Until eventually, we um, come out of this whole thing with a running total, how many stories exist to how many don't. Which, I don't know how many do exist, but that's seven for series one. Right, and then we could do percentages or whatever we want to get some final value out of it. So, aggregate, use it if you're not already. Moving on to our final section, and then we can all go home, maybe. Uh, Fahrenheit to Celsius conversion. So, I used to work for an American company, and I am British, and as such, there is a cliche that British people like to talk about the weather. It is true, we do. We talk about the weather a lot, because the weather is a constant source of surprise to us. Because in the UK, you can have four seasons in a single day. It's, it's how our weather is. So I, as I am often tending to, would talk to my American colleagues about the weather. And they would say things like, it's 100 degrees outside. And I would say 100 degrees, that is the boiling temperature of water. Wow. And then of course I'd remember that they use Fahrenheit, which is used in America. And we use Celsius, which is used everywhere else. So. What is the conversion? Ah, it's something along the lines of deduct 32, multiply by five, multiply, divide by nine, sure. And then do a, I'm doing a math dot round to make it into a sensible looking value. And then finally do a degree C at the end to make it look nice. I've got a load of modification of variables there, which I don't allow because it's functional. So there is a structure I can use for getting around this problem. Here it's called identity. It can be called all sorts of things, to be honest. And I've heard it called things. But they think of it as a box, okay? This is an identity of T. T is the value I'm storing. T is a generic, so it could be anything. And all it is is a value. And if I pass it in here, a bit of syntactic sugar so I don't bother to instantiate an object. But think of it as a box. It's a thing in a box. That's all it is. And then I can create, uh, I can create a, there we go, an extension method hanging off it called bind. I've heard this called all sorts of things too. Map is sometimes the name used for this. But bind for now will do. What it says is there's a two from type and a two type. So this often will be decimal to decimal in my example, but at least in one case it'll be decimal into a string. So what it means is from type and two type. Here's my identity, it's my box. And this function will run and convert whatever the old thing was into the new thing. So what this is effectively do, and then turn the whole thing into a new identity. So what this is effectively doing is getting the old thing in this box, taking it out, turning it into something new, putting it in a new box, sending it on its way. Okay, make sense? It's a relay race. It's a relay race where you have a series of runners along there. Each runner is a function, and you're getting you get your person here, and they're passing this value. And each one is doing something, passing it on, do something and pass it on. This is a monad, incidentally. That's what they are. Now, there's a little more to it than that. There are some formal definitions, blah, blah, blah. But from an engineer's perspective, this is what a monad is. There's how you use it. All it is, is a series of function calls. Now, there we go, look. My curried functions, I found a use. So I'm gonna do bind, subtract 32, that's a function. Multiply by five, divide by nine, and so on, there we go. That's nice and neat. No intermediate variables being stored. Uh, no variables are actually ever being changed, so everything's immutable. One nice flow of uh, One nice flow of uh, instructions. Monad. Hopefully, everyone's comfortable now with what on earth they are. Now, there is, and we can take this one step further. This one is the maybe. So, there are many monads out there. Most of them, frankly, are useless in C sharp, but there are a couple of good ones. A couple of good ones we can use. Haskell has more monads than I know what to do with. C sharp, really, a couple will do. This one's called maybe. Maybe has two states. I'll get into that in a minute. So, this is my second flow. Now, I am, as you can tell, really cool, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, because I'm cool, I use lead speak because that's what the kids all do still, isn't it? Yeah, they still do that? No, I don't know. So, I'll replace all the A's with fours, uh, the E's with threes, the I's with ones, and, and so on, because I'm cool, and that's what I do. 
I should also put my cap on backwards, and I'll probably have a hoodie. I don't know. Whatever's cool these days. That's what I'll do. Fine. So um, I'm going to go put person ID inside a maybe, so it's basically put it in there, and then call get person. Now, I don't know what get person does, but let's imagine for a moment that get person might or might not return something. Okay? Person ID 12 is what I'm passing in. Let's imagine person ID 12 doesn't exist, and I get back a null. Well, what's going to happen here? I'll tell you what's going to happen here. Null reference exception will explode. Well, that's no good. I can't do that. I mean, that looks lovely, but I can't do that. I can't have a null reference exception upsetting this. I need a null check. So there is a way of baking that into the monad. Looks like this. This is a maybe. So like I said, it exists in two states. It's like Schrodinger's box. Um, it might contain something. It might contain nothing. There's a few ways of doing this in C Sharp. I start with an abstract class, which sits at the base, and then inherit off it the, st the, st the possible states. One I've called here just. I've also heard it called something. And I've also heard maybe called option, if that name means anything else. But this represents it worked as a value. This represents it didn't work as no value, because I don't know. So until I open the box, like Schrodinger's cat, if I made an abstract of type cat and then inherited off it to say alive cat, dead cat, that would be the same principle. Until I open the box, I don't know what it is. And if I don't care, I simply shove it along. There we go. And a more complicated bind. This bind says, do a null check if it's not null. And the previous type was actually a something or a just or whatever, as it actually contained something. Then run the function and return a new one. Otherwise, return nothing. Which means that if I go back to this, this means, let's say imagine this turn. So this turn starts as a maybe with 12 in it. Let's say this returns null. This is actually a something at this point, but it's got a null in it. This bind says, check the something. It's a null. I'm not going to execute this function, in which case, simply return this function unexecuted. This one says the previous one was a nothing. Don't execute. Previous one was a nothing. Don't execute. All the way down. So one flow, but the null check is baked in. It's uh, the best explanation of this I ever came across was in Scott Lashin's website, uh, F Sharp for Fun and Profit. It was he calls it railway-oriented architecture. So you imagine two trains with uh, sorry two stair lines, train lines like this, and each set of points is a function. And this is the something happy path: run a function, run a function, run a function. And then at some point you get back nothing or uh, an exception occurs, in which case you shift down to the nothing path and then just glide to the station without doing a single other thing. But one flow, but uh, you don't need to worry about null checks or cat try catches or any of that. It's all baked into the structure. So imagine just how much code that's saving you based on having to do a null check with a try catch around every single one. Uh, I'm just blasting this one quickly. Either that's another one where you've just got radically different options. I sometimes use this to say it worked or an exception occurred, in which case on this side we return an exception. Same basic idea, and there's a slightly more complicated. If anyone wants to see that code, I'll throw it up again in a bit. Now, a question I sometimes get asked, are there libraries in NuGet that do functional? Yeah, language ext, there we go. It does exist. I prefer to roll my own, as it were. I prefer to make my own functional extensions, but there's nothing wrong with language ext. I've had a play with it, it's perfectly good. It doesn't use entirely the same terminology as I do, but it's fine. Look, there's language ext doing my conversion from um, uh, it uses map instead of bind, so there you go. But it's basically the same principle. Further reading, some ideas for you if you're interested. A uh, very, very good book on the subject that's out at the moment is Functional Programming in C Sharp by Enrico Buonanno. It's published by Manny. It is a most excellent book. I do recommend it quite thoroughly. Uh, there are also other books. There's uh, Vishnu Angoro's book in, uh, published by Pact. There is a YouTube video. I should mention this one because it was the first exposure I ever had to functional programming by Kathleen Dollard. Uh, there's some plural site courses. You could look at F Sharp for fun and profit. It's not just for F Sharp. There's some very good theory articles, which I recommend. Um, if you want to go really hardcore, there's Learn Your Haskell for great good. So you could go purely functional. And also, I have a book coming out. So if anyone is interested, here is a link to, my, uh, to the O'Reilly site. And O'Reilly have told me that this will give you a month or so free on their website. And you can read, amongst them, my book.
And uh, before anybody asks, this is not my final animal. I don't know what the animal will be. Apparently, there is a secret cabal of animal choosers somewhere in uh, Aurelia. When the book's ready for publication, they kind of knock on the ceiling, and then an animal is lowered down uh, from the chimney or something. I don't know, but I don't know. So uh, I spent about 13 months writing this thing. It has many, many bad jokes, I'm warning you right now, because that's just the way I roll. I keep expecting Aurelia to tell me to take them out, and they haven't, so I keep putting them in. So feel free. Um, so, yeah, we go. Does anybody have any questions?